Cool. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to get into my background a little bit later, but one of the things that I like to do at the beginning of the presentation is let everybody know that it's okay to boo. I don't think that there's there's enough of that going on, so I like that feedback. Sometimes it's hard to tell if you're paying attention, so if I like hit the wrong button or I start reading from the slide, feel free to boo. Make sure we keep it entertaining, okay? Uh, so we're talking about communicating with data, and you know, obviously they say a picture is worth a thousand words. But visualizations are just part of that whole equation of communicating with data, right? We've got to acquire the data. We've got to, to store the data, prep the data, then we can visualize it. We've also got our kind of reports. We might want to embed our analytics into our web, our web pages or our, our member functions so that they get a sense of what the, the, uh, the performance is of the organization. How are we doing to meeting the goals of our organization? Uh, but I, I heard it said really well the other day, and it's, it, you know, it takes a, a jackhammer to get our, uh, I'm sorry, it takes a hand. See, now you can boo. I screwed that up. Uh, it, it takes a sledgehammer to get our data into our systems and a jackhammer to get it out. So we've got data spread all over the place, right? So just to back way up in the history of computers, that when they first started being invented, there was this whole human-computer interaction. And they talked about it was a very linear process. It was, you know, I'd take a stack of punch cards, I put that in, it does some processing, and I get my output, and I say, okay, that's great. So this guy named Claude Shannon, who came up with a lot of great ideas. He's a very interesting cat to read about. Uh, he was part of World War II and the code-breaking stuff. He's gotten the Nobel Prize for various things. But based on the, the foundation of his work, the father of information theory, which is pretty cool. I wish I was known as the father of something that cool. Um, but anyway. The, the whole human-computer interaction was turned into the concept of perception, cognition, and action. Data is no good unless we can actually act on it. We take that action, we feed it back into the loop, and then that changes our perceptions again. <clears throat> so when we talk about perception, there's two types of perception. There's top-down, which is our history. And what do we know? What do we bring to the table? What's our bias towards something? We've always done it that way. You know, take a point from Jamie and the innovation. We've always done it that way, so it's not going to work. Uh, and then there's bottom up. So some of the concepts that Sandy was talking about with, uh, it, that's our, our first instincts. What do, we, what do we immediately see? How do we immediately feel? Uh, what's our first impression, et cetera? So <clears throat> if I make some changes to my about John Fitzgerald slide, start to see that <clears throat> I start doing things like putting some bold headings in there. It makes it easier to understand what's important. I put the Byzantelli, I put the at sign with the Byzantelli link, right? Everybody knows that that's Twitter. I could put the Twitter icon, but I didn't feel like it. Uh, and then uh, just using words that are easier to remember, colors to call things out. So instead of my John Fitzgerald, John Fitzgerald 8775-A LinkedIn, Link, I shortened it to Byzantelli, right? Sounds cool. Sounds kind of like a superhero, I think, maybe. <laughs> uh, but anyway, those, those are some of the bottom-up changes that you guys should be thinking about when you're talking about communicating with data, and it factors into all aspects of what you're doing, you know, the website usage, uh, data and analytics, etc. cetera. Uh, so just to, to talk a little bit about my background, uh, I've been working with associations for a number of years now. I've done a lot of work with, with implementing business intelligence solutions for them. Uh, and the company that I work for now is called Pomerol Partners. So Pomerol started in the UK, uh, spun out of uh, Deutsche Bank, uh, big into the financial services. I joined them when they actually expanded. So they started in London. I joined them when they expanded into the US, uh, which happened last year, but I joined them this year. Uh, we are a, a managed service provider of a software called Click, which is a business intelligence platform. Some of you may have heard about. Uh, unfortunately, most of you probably haven't because for some reason their marketing has never really gotten the word out all that well, but it's really great stuff. I'll try not to make it too much of a pitch about Click because I'm talking more about communicating with data. <clears throat> but if we talk about top-down and bottom-up changes, if I want to talk about who I am as a person, you want to be able to understand John, not that that's the goal of this 20 minutes that I have. I'm not going to talk about every one of these pictures in depth. 
but you do, it is better to know a little bit of background about somebody. Now I'm trying to keep this lighthearted, so I'm putting some stuff about, you know, here's me uh, dressed up as Dog Bounty Hunter. Uh, my cohort who's with me today is dressed up as Sean Connery. Everybody remember the SNL Sean Connery skit? So it, it was that, was part of our, uh, our, our theme for that, that uh, costume party. Uh, I've played rugby, I've got kids, you know, that, that helps form this foundation of understanding of who I am. And all of that foundation is important when I'm communicating with data. It's important that people understand when I say retention, I mean this exact thing. Don't make any assumptions that we're all talking the same language. They need that training, all right? So <laughs> the other thing is things like background color are important too, right? Uh, Sandy talked about it, you know, we, we want to, uh, to draw attention to things. So these are what's known as Gestalt principles. I could spend two hours talking just about that, but that wouldn't be nearly as entertaining. So how many people remember the uh, three is a magic number, Schoolhouse Rocks, right? I rewatched it trying to figure out why three was a magic number. I still am not really sure I watched it twice. It's just like three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18. Uh, so why is three a magic number? Well, if it's three wishes, it's great. If it's three strikes, it sucks, right? So I need to give people some context. So colors are a good way to help communicate, help get that, that bottom-up foundation. I immediately know green is good, red is bad. Uh, some countries it might be the opposite, I hope not, but, uh, but it, it's very easy to make those changes and to communicate what's good or bad just by using some simple color principles. <clears throat> Does anybody know where this is? Looks kind of like an island off of England or something, right? Does anybody know where it is now? Any Game of Thrones fans? All right, I hope, a couple. So there's Casterly Rock. I said it right that time. I stumbled on that all the time. Uh, King's Landing. So. That's where that island actually is, right? So having some context around your data is, is extremely important. Uh, if I show this chart showing what the margin percentage was uh, versus total revenue, and I have my, my context in there, I've got my margin goal is 37%. Now, it looks like Orlando was fantastic, right? Orlando is the best conference that we had. But what they did in this case is they actually chopped the axis off. So you see that the bottom axis only goes from 34 to 40%. So it kind of zoomed in on it. That doesn't provide as much value as the bigger picture. You guys didn't know what that little island was until you saw it in context of the bigger picture. So be careful when you're designing stuff and when you're trying to communicate a point, be careful that you're not communicating a small version of that that they can't see the bigger picture. So the reality was there wasn't that much spread between the margin performance of those respective uh, conferences. <clears throat> and you can see that New York, while it's red, which is bad, right? It's really kind of right on the line. So it's really not that bad. And then the other thing is, are, do we really care about a percentage target? Or are we more concerned with what's the overall value to the organization? How much money do we truly make? And that's almost a better KPI than, than that arbitrary, we want a 37% return on our investment. Uh, I think as organizations, the key, the key, uh, the, the KPIs that we talk about are actually, uh, they're different than sales organizations talk about. They're different than financially driven organizations are talking about. Not that losing money is a good thing, um, but you know, obviously we want to keep track of what's really important to us. Uh, and, and some of the ideas for this are driven from a guy named Alberto Cairo, uh, thefunctionalart.com. Those of you at home, do not go search this website right now. Please wait until lunch or something. Uh, but he's, he spends his days going through basically news articles and other stuff like that that have visualizations and showing how people skew the results based off of the visualizations that they choose. So the other thing that we get when, when we're doing a, an implementation or we're consulting about data and analytics is we want one number that tells us everything, right? So unfortunately, this is not Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. 
The answer to life in the universe and everything is not 42. We don't know what it is, and it's probably not one number, right? But it's also probably not 400 numbers. So if you go and you Google for bad dashboard design, this is one of the images that comes up. And I, I don't know where to look. I see a bunch of green, I see some reds. What, which one is actually the, the key performance indicator or set of key performance indicators? So when you're trying to communicate things, what you need to do is you need to slim it down, make sure that people understand what are the important things. But it's also important to build that whole story. So I need information from my event management system. I need information from my membership registration system, like my retention number. I, need, I might need information from my financials for my expenses, right? So I need to pull all of that data from multiple different systems together. And that's what helps me generate that whole picture, that, that, uh, that top-down look at my organizational performance. So the bottom-up stuff, pretty easy. I can change the colors. I can make things red or green based on values, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but having that whole story is important. And why that's, a, you know, why can't Johnny read? If I see something on the dashboard that shows me that something is red, I have to be able to understand why it's red. So with Click, they talk about DAR. It stands for Dashboard Analysis and Reporting. And this is actually something that you can use. It doesn't matter that, that I'm talking about Click. This is a good way to lay out dashboards when you're trying to do stuff. You've got a dashboard tab that shows you your KPIs. <clears throat> and then you've got a series of analysis tabs. So I'm concerned that my retention number is low compared to a target number, uh, which nobody booed at that slide because there wasn't actually a target number out there. So I wasn't really sure what my target was. Uh, but if I want to drill into the details, then I go into subsequent tabs. So maybe I'm looking at different demographic information. Is my retention bad for a certain subset? You know, those millennials, uh, damn them. Uh, no offense to any that are in here, but uh, maybe the member demographics are gonna lead me to, hey, I should pay more attention to this particular set of demographics. Maybe it's, maybe it's something to do with events. Hey, my event registrations have tapered off, or the cer there's certain kinds of events that nobody's attending. All of these things, all of these different perspectives or analysis tabs are gonna help me help drive me to, uh, to better, uh, better understanding of what's going on with my organization. And then I can get into the reporting, so I get into the details. Now I've got an understanding of what's going on. Now I need to identify somebody that I can actually go out and target, that I can actually send a, an email to, or actually pick up the phone, or maybe hit them on Twitter, or LinkedIn, or something like that. But, but I need something that's actionable. So I need that reporting and those details, and I need to be able to get all the way down to the bottom level. So <clears throat> that whole concept of DAR really improves that cognition step. <clears throat> Do you know that bad, according to HBR, which actually referenced a study by IBM, which didn't really provide a lot of background on their methodology, at least not in the time that I was willing to commit to reading it, uh, $3.1 trillion a year on bad data. That's like 15% of our GDP. That's a lot of time and energy that we spend dealing with data problems. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that I say when, small plug for Click, one of the things that I say when people are looking at, at BI tools is make sure that you get visibility to all of your data because there's stuff hiding in there in data quality issues. Anybody here not have data quality issues? Right. So, how many people here have a BI roadmap or a data and analytics roadmap? One, sort of. Maybe. Uh, most of the roadmaps that I know of are they're either locked in people's heads or it's whoever screams loudest and has the highest title. That's the next project that we're going to do. Right? So if I really want to create understanding, what I need is I need to build on that data strategy. So I love Kevin's uh, Albert Einstein quote, you know, if I have an hour to solve a problem, I'm going to spend 55 minutes defining it, five minutes actually solving it. I need to have a strategy in place in order to communicate that data out to people. I need to understand what's the most important. First thing I need to do is I need to get smart. Right? 
So my goals need to be smart goals. They need to be specific. I'm going to increase membership retention, sorry, by 2%, Jamie, sorry. <laughs> uh, measurable, I know how to measure retention, although I gotta get specific about how exactly I'm counting retention in my counting. Rejoins or not, and, you know, et, et cetera. Uh, it's got to be attainable. I can't say I'm going to raise, I'm going to increase my retention rate by 20%. Everybody in the organization laughs at me. Uh, they've got to be relevant. Well, I would hope that membership is relevant to everybody. Uh, and they have to be time bound. So I'm going to say, I'm going to do that this year or in the next two years. But I need to have smart goals. And then I can map those out to specific projects. So maybe we've got some new marketing campaigns. Maybe we've got some other stuff. But all of these goals need to be smart goals to make sure that we're not, uh, that they're realistic and that they're smart. <clears throat> so after we define the projects, the next thing we want to do when I started uh, my old company, which was basically acquired by Palmerall, I called it Raise Analytics. And everybody said, well, what's Raise Analytics? And I'm like, they're like, Raise R-A-Z-E? And I said, no, Raise, like Raise the Roof, right? So, <laughs> so we want to raise the roof. Figure this will make it easier for everybody to understand. You know, hey, who was that idiot that was up talking about talking about communicating with Dan? Oh, I remember raise the roof. So uh, hopefully this helps a little bit with some retention. Uh, but TDWI, the Data Warehousing Institute, did a study. Theirs was a little bit more well defined, but uh, businesses spend six hundred billion, six hundred eleven billion dollars a year printing postage, and staff overhead dealing with data quality issues. How many returns do you get? Just bad data. How much are you spending on your marketing automation system with bad email addresses? You know, that, that's a lot of time and energy that's wasted. So when I'm evaluating projects, what I use is the raise methodology. I look at revenue, automation, and insights. So that's my business impact. <clears throat> If I can increase revenue, if I can automate something and reduce the cost, reduce the time that it takes to do something and get, get the data into the hands of the people that need it faster, that's better, right? And then insights. Sometimes I've got system locked or I've got, ooh. Uh, sometimes I've got data locked in multiple different systems. If I was able to actually combine the data between those two systems, I can get some insights that I wouldn't get by looking at stuff separately in a vacuum. All right, so those are the things that I want to evaluate that are kind of on the positive. And then I want to look at the soundness or, and the effort. So how sound is the data? You know, if it's in a bunch of spreadsheets and there's, there's no controls on it, then it's not necessarily very sound data. If I've got a brand new AMS system and I just put it in and I didn't do a lot of data validation on the data going in, the data is not very sound. Uh, and, and then the effort that it's going to take. So if, I, if the answers to my questions are going to require me to join together 20 different sources, the effort is going to be huge. Or if it's one source and it's extremely complex or it's got vendor lockdown where it's hard to get the data out, the effort on that is gonna be big. So we take those and we actually, we plot them out. I just found out like two months ago that this is referred to as a Boston matrix. I don't know if anybody knew that or not, but, uh, but we, we plot these on a Boston matrix and we say, okay, what's the revenue automation and insight impact going up? And what's the soundness and effort going to the right? Any project that deals with or addresses the soundness of the data is going to be high on that soundness scale. Any data that sucks, excuse my language, is gonna be low on that soundness scale. So then we, just, we focus on the stuff that's important. We still focus on the stuff that's in, uh, in that upper right quadrant. All right, so I have 40 seconds for questions. Oh, I would like to point out one thing. Pomerol is a region in France, so we do have some bottles of wine at our table that we are raffling off, as well as the stuff at the end of the day. Question? Yes. My name is Jonathan Thatcher, former director of research at Apex. 
do you see in your client or in the industry the so-called survivor bias? People prefer to look at their successes on their dashboards and not to look at failures to the point that they don't easily recognize the difference anymore. I think that book, Good to Great, back in 2001, yep. I said here are the six companies. We'll look at them now, and they're not, they're not anywhere. That's so, right, right. So, it, yeah, I, th I think there definitely is that kind of confirmation bias. Look at how great we are. Look at what we've done well. Nobody wants to actually drill into who's not buying our top selling products. And that's where the opportunity is. Who hasn't been doing it then? Uh, we don't spend enough time doing that. I absolutely believe that. Did, did you push the button? I did press the okay. button. <laughs> Jennifer Mahal with the American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. Do you have any um, advice or kind of methodology framework to use just to, you know, when you talked about in the beginning, when you present <coughs> your your data, um, how not to show a skew view um, within the context, etc. I mean, is there any way, what we do is we basically kind of we, we take a view and several of us look at it and kind of say, you know, what does this mean to you? And try to pick apart things that might not be completely accurately showing the picture, but is there any approach to that that works? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a strong believer in when you're, when you're doing all of this stuff, you need to have various stakeholders. So you need to have representation from a lot of different levels in the organization. We see a lot of people that uh, or a lot of organizations that, that just keep it at the top level, they don't, they don't bring in those people that understand the, the inner workings of a, like the AMS system. So uh, that's what I would say is make sure that you have all levels of the organization because the people down at the lower levels are going to be able to give you insight into what specifically might you be overlooking.